The last set of this presentation consists of a discussion of data science education, which is sort of the technology and the ideas that underlie this whole um, course set and curriculum that this is a part of. And there's a nice uh, New York Times article, which you can check out on. This will be given in the resources for this particular um, talk. We've already told you lots of jobs. Um, it has more jobs than the so-called simulate. Remember computational science was the third paradigm simulation. Uh, there's a general understanding that data science has more jobs associated with than computational science. Because simulants are almost just the nature of the jobs. It's big science versus the long tail of science. Data science is broadly applicable. Simulation is not so broadly applicable. When it is applied, it tends to run small numbers of jobs, each requiring large amounts of computers. Um, so data science has various topics in it, policy, curation, algorithms, applications, programming models. Actual systems, statistics, we showed you how statistics was important in the Large Hadron Collider. And we need to know about clouds and programming and human computer interfaces. So it's a broad field. And we're trying to set up this data science certificate and master's program here. And um, we hopefully will involve statistics from the College of Arts and Scientists, Science with the three different units in the School of Informatics and Computing, Computer Science, Informatics, and Information and Library Science. We are also interested in exploring the, the Kelly, our business school, uh, and offering, the, uh, taking some of these ideas and combining with Kelly. And uh, data science is interesting to offer online, because it's actually useful to offer online things that are not broadly available, uh, because you can then collect students there may be at the, you know, the beginning of data science, maybe any one university doesn't have enough students to motivate data science for that students at that university. Do you bring 100 universities together, then between them they have enough students to support a few data science degrees, which is sort of the idea here. Now this uh, slide here points out that online education is indeed growing rapidly. And this is the... Uh, um, Points out in 2011, 32% of students are taking at least one online course. And um, so this is the online enrollment as a percentage of total enrollment. And um, this is students taking, uh, which is presumably goes with uh, this graph here. Number of online students here is over 7 million. And uh, we have for 2011, we have, um, actually it looks like 28% here, not 32%. But it says 32% on the slide. But anyway, let's call it 30%, round it off at 30%. 32% appears to be the yellow, which is the online enrollment as a percentage of total enrollment. So let's assume this number here, which is just wrong. Should say 32% of the student of the, of the students are, are online enrolled. And here, here are some statistics about the actual field of MOOCs, massively online open courses. And we have Coursera, the number of users and course enrollment as students. Um, here's a course enrollment measured in millions. Here we have the Silver Open University, which is presumably the, the system in the United Kingdom, with the downloads growing rapidly on, on iTunes. And here is the Open University uh, demography, 46% in the, in, uh, in um, Ada, actually 20, we read said 25% US, 30% United Kingdom, 16% China, so good export for United Kingdom. And for Coursera, we have 35% um, North America, 21% Asia, and 28% Europe. Well, similar broad uh, demographics, but uh, slightly different from the online the open university. So I've already explained why MOOCs are relevant to data science. It's a new field with few courses at most universities. 
the way uh, you'll see uh, MOOCs are done is illustrated by this particular um, uh, offering we have here of X Informatics. You'll find this pre recorded little lessons. Those lessons are 3 to 15 minutes or 5 to 15 minutes in length. And this is something to do with the boredom link limit, which is described in this blog at Coursera. Um, these are three to 15 minute entities are lessons, which can be taken uh, independently. Well, obviously, presumably take them in order, but you can you don't you can re rest at the end of a lesson and play continue the next lesson when you want to. And then we're using Google Course Builder initially to um, to build the um, MOOC. That's a Python open source project which effectively builds the whole course as a playlist of songs and quizzes and other types of material. And <clears throat> we are also building, and we're sort of trying to do the iTunes, if you think about that example of iTunes, uh, what does iTunes do, what is iTunes and, and uh, Google Play, these are repositories of, uh, of songs, and so a repository of songs, which is a repository of um, of, um, that becomes a repository of lessons. We're using that idea when we support software because we have these so-called side MOOCs attached to our data, our X Informatics course. We have a side MOOC telling you how to use a cloud to run the software for the course, or a side MOOC telling you how to do Python for the course. That's a uh, current version of the uh, of this X Informatics MOOC. Uh, by the time you read. Uh, uh, this uh, online uh, course, it will already be out of date, but uh, that's an illustration here is uh, if you take any one unit, is a second unit becomes a scientific method. And it tells you here, each of these are the lessons here. These uh, seven lessons, each of which is around a 10 minute, uh, 10 minute so-called song or lesson. And these are closed captioned to increase accessibility. That's required by Indiana University. And uh, another interesting concept is customizable MOOCs. You could either teach one class to a lot of students or lots of classes to a modest number of students. If you do the second choice, it's somewhat easier to grade because if you only have 50 to 100 students in the class, you can use traditional grading methods. And of course, you can customize. Of course, customization has a significant cost attached to it, but you can customize it um, for a particular audience. And uh, you can even allow self customization so that each user, each student can customize. And each of these models supported by a repository in the cloud. And uh, we imagine a sort of um, economy, a, a lesson economy where um, teachers um, use existing lesson objects, produce a new course, add a few more lessons, and put those lessons back into the repository. And this may or may not involve the exchange of money. That's a, presumably you will have open source repositories and closed source rep and proprietary repositories because the model of the repository works whether or not it's open source. Well, here's a repository we produced in the cloud area by taking uh, videos produced uh, uh, last year in a so-called science cloud um, summer school and making them for all the available. So we have 20, uh, roughly one hour units available here for general use. Uh, Judy Chu from Indiana University and Linda Hayden from Elizabeth City State University are going to look into this idea for producing modules for historically black colleges, uh, which have particular curricula for which uh, standalone general purpose MOOC may not be apl applicable. And so this is, um, it is a case where probably cloud computing ECSU may not have a faculty really expert enough to teach that. So by using material from Indiana University, uh, they're able to give their students this expertise. The MOOC is a easier way to distribute the material than traditional online education, which involves a lot of detailed online faculty time. Here's this uh, MOOC that Judy Chu is, is building. Uh, pretty exciting. This one, this is a complementary to, to this course. Um, X Informatics, it provides 
detailed discussion of cloud computing. So this points out that cloud can, the MOOCs are compelling in a couple of limits. High volume courses, such as introductory courses where the scalability of MOOCs allows you to take a high volume course and reach a lot of students. Or niche areas, these sort of opposite limits, where there's some student interest, but neither not enough faculty expertise and not enough students of a given university to justify traditional courses. So you want to join many institutions together to reach a big enough number of students to make it feasible to build a course. Here's a comment on um, the learning tools used by um, by lots of learning professionals, the top 10 uh, tools you, you use, and it's quite, it's quite interesting. Actually, the Twitter is very popular among professionals. We have YouTube coming up in popularity. Google Dart is popular in 2012, somewhat increased from 2009. Google Search, WordPress um, um, is, a, is an important. Dropbox come up a lot. Skype come up, PowerPoint. Come, actually, interesting. PowerPoint has come up, Facebook, Wikipedia, um, SlideShare um, has gone down. It's, that's a way for sharing uh, presentations. Probably uh, MOOCs have taken away from SlideShare because it's given you alternatives. And um, so, and of course, a lot of other ones must have dropped out because nearly all of these are increases. The only one that's actually gone down in popularity is SlideShare. So I think, and uh, Blogger, but Blogger is roughly the same. 